So maybe we'll start trying to get started here. It is wonderful to see the gathering people. I feel as if we're emerging out of the cocoon or something like that. Um, and and I, I think I overheard somebody saying, I wouldn't have missed these talks, and especially being able to not miss them in person. That's wonderful. So for all of those of you who are on Zoom, thank you for joining on Zoom. And just remember, you're missing the coffee, the uh, eggs, <laughs> and the fruits, and all sorts of wonderful things here. So next time, maybe join in in person. Um, but we we have two wonderful talks lined up here today. And I'm just so uh, tickled pink to be able to introduce both of our presenters. Um, and so we'll start, we're gonna start off with the new faces talk. And, um, and uh, Whitney Harrington is one of our rising stars um, who completed her bachelor's in neurobiology at Harvard, followed by her MD, PhD, and pediatric residency and pediatric. ID Fellowship at the UW uh, and, and Seattle Children's. Um, she's now an Associate Professor in Pediatric Infectious Diseases, a Principal Investigator in the Center for Global Infectious Diseases at uh, Infectious Diseases Research at Seattle Children's, um, an Affiliate Investigator in Fred Hutch and um, an Infectious Disease Physician at Seattle Children's. Um, Dr. Harrington's research is focused on maternal fetal women immunology and infection during pregnancy and infancy. Um, she studies the role of maternal mycochiromism um, in fetal and infant immunity. And she has also recently begun studies to better understand T cell populations from the lactating breast and female genital tract. And today she will talk to us about a novel and non-invasive method to sample luminal uh, immune cells from the lower female genital tract. Thank you, Jay. So um, thank you, Jay, for that very kind introduction. And um, thank you to all the support organizers for the invitation to uh, come and present this work. This is really probably the most fun talk I will get to give this year, both because um, this is a very exciting pilot project that we've just started in our lab, so I very much welcome feedback, ideas for collaboration, ideas for extensions, and questions we can ask with this technique. And also because I'm the opening act for my mentor, colleague, and friend, um, Heather Gaspin, so I really um, am delighted to be here today to, to share this work. Actually, next slide. So as Jay mentioned, um, the majority of the work in my lab is focused on infection pregnancy and thinking about fetal immunity and fetal immune development. Um, we do a lot of work on the transfer of T cells across the placenta from the pregnant mom to the fetus, which is a phenomenon called maternal microchimerism. And as part of studying uh, maternal microchimerism, we published a paper in 2022, which was a collaboration with Heather, looking at um, the predictors of transfer of maternal cells into the fetus, and then also thinking about predictors of maternal cells in the infant over the first year of life. And one of the most interesting observations we made in that study was that exclusive breastfeeding was very strongly associated with maternal microchimerism. So um, that work really led to an interest in human immunology and particular T cell biology in the lactating breast. And that's what really led to an area of research in our lab where we got excited about understanding what kinds of T cells were present in the lactating breast. And much of this work actually comes from the HIV field, the thinking about maternal child transmission of HIV. So we had a lot of people that we were um, uh, that had really formed the field, and then we extended it to look at um, the response of the lactating breast to vaccination, and specifically mRNA vaccination uh, to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Um, this was also a collaboration with Heather, which was really um, fantastic and exciting. And what it really did for our lab was start to expand our interest in mucosal immunology, as Jay was alluding to. So around the time that we were really developing this project in my lab, we had um, an exceptionally talented research scientist, uh, Quinn Peters, who's here today, who came to the lab and brought with her an expertise in the female genital tract. 
So she had been working in Chris Whitby's lab up at Seattle U, thinking about how to collect bacterial enzymes from the female genital tract. And the technique that they were using was um, sampling the, the female genital tract with these soft discs. So this is a disposable menstrual product that's designed to collect menstrual blood, but can also be used in non-menstruating individuals to collect cervical vaginal secretions. And their lab had done work to show that they could look at enzymes coming off of these um, discs. And at the same time that we had been doing this breast milk work, Quinn came and we thought, well, this is really exciting. She presented her thesis work and we thought, well, why don't we try to get immune cell populations off of these discs? So um, just to orient you to these discs a bit more, they actually sit around the cervical off, so they're popped up into the vaginal vortices and they're kind of anchored there. So when somebody is in an upright position, you really think that we're principally sort of, um, sampling cells that are coming off of and around the cervix, as opposed to from the vaginal lumen um, more uh, posteriorly. These are similar to, but distinct from reusable uh, vaginal menstrual cups, which are a silicone product that can be washed and reused. Some people refer to the discs that we're using as this, and sometimes they refer to them as disposable cups. So I recognize that this product has been used, particularly in the HIV field, for quite a long time to look at cytokines, for example, so soluble factors that are secreted into the cervical vaginal fluid. So you might ask, and this is probably um, much more obvious to this audience, why do this? Why sample the female genital tract in this approach with this, with this methodology? And it's really because all of the alternatives that are used to sample this space require a speculum exam and an invasive procedure. So you really need a healthcare provider or a clinical research staff who is doing a speculum exam on a person. So this is something that's done to people. And um, there are three main approaches that have been used historically, and again, much of this literature comes from the HIV field. So one approach is what's called cervical vaginal lavage, where you essentially wash the vagina and the um, fortices with saline, and then you suck it back up into this collector, and then you do analysis on that. Um, a second main approach is a cider brush, which is um, inserted into the cervical off the endothermics and is collecting cells using manual um, disruption of the barrier. And then the most invasive approach is biopsy, where you would actually sample, for example, the cervix or the vagina, you would take that tissue and associate it and isolate cells. So these all sample slightly different cell populations. Um, there are pros and cons to using each approach, which has been really beautifully detailed by colleagues here in Seattle. This is um, a great paper that was published by Florian and um, Julie and Lyle, Sean, all folks from here at Steve DeRosa, um, kind of comparing and contrasting these different approaches. But the common denominator is they're invasive and they require this um, invasive approach. So we thought, why don't we try this non-invasive approach to sample these cells instead and see what we get back. So this has been really the best kind of science in my opinion, which is a lot of experimentation, a ton of trial and error and a lot of failure, but a lot of learning along the way. So um, what we ask people to do is to self-insert these discs and then wear them for about four hours. And then they self-retrieve them and stick them in a conical and hand them off to us for processing. And this is a disc that's been placed back into a conical. It has RPMI on it and the media has changed yellow because it's acidic. What's everything that's coming off the disc is acidic. If you just take the cells that are in that fluid and look at them under the microscope, you will find that the vast majority of those cells are epithelial cells. Not, not unsurprisingly, and um, those are comprised of both live and dead epithelial cells. But there are also lymphocytes, which are these bright star-like dots that you can see under here. And those are the population that we're very interested in in terms of thinking about the immunology of this space. If you just take this whole sample and you spin it down, what you end up with is this massive bell pellet. So for anyone who practices blood or other kind of rare um, or more rare cells, cell populations from tissues, oftentimes you have a very small cell pellet. This is the enormous cell pellet. And the majority of these cells are epithelial cells. And that poses a problem if you're really interested in phenotyping these cells with low cytometry. And the main challenges that we encountered were that um, there were so many of these epithelial cells. A lot of them are dead. And what happens to dead epithelial cells is that they clump. So if you take a bunch of dead epithelial cells and you put them in your flow cytometer, your flow core becomes very unhappy with you. Uh, because you clogged machines. 
Uh, the other thing that we noticed as um, we were developing this technique was that there's a lot of mucus in the vagina, which is exactly what you expect coming off of these cervical vaginal samples. And that mucus, um, as Quinn would describe to me, you can see the cells are trapped inside the mucus. So it's not really enough to just try to wash the sample. You really want to collect the cells that are there. You have to, you have to deal with this mucus problem. You have to be able to break it down. So after about six to nine months of work, um, Quinn developed an approach using a lot of different techniques and trial and errors and experimentation to maximize the recovery of immune cells off of these discs. And the main things that we do are that we rinse the disc to get all the cells that are stuck to the disc off of the disc. We add DTT, which is a reducing agent that breaks thiol bonds, and that's really important in terms of dissolving the mucus and being able to liberate the cells that are trapped in that mucus. We then physically strain the sample to remove the clumpy epithelial cells and then um, can enumerate them and resuspend them and actually cryo preserve them. So, one of the things we're very excited about with this technique is that we get at least about 70% cell recovery after cryo preservation. Which you think, if you're thinking about applying this technique to a large field study, for example, you need to be able to cryo preserve your samples. Um, we have found that when we're interested in principally phenotyping immune cells, it's very helpful to get rid of a lot of the epithelial cells first, or your flow experiments take a long time. And so the way that we do that is with the CD45 enrichment. And we can um, both enrich before or after prior observation and get really nice um, immune cell populations back. So um, just to demonstrate to you that we can recognize um, typical immune cell populations with this approach, this is just a flow gating scheme where we're looking at a paired PBMC sample from peripheral blood with a cervical vaginal fluid sample from uh, one of these discs. Uh, down here is your main lymphocyte population, which you can see nicely recapitulated in the sample. So those are your T and your B cells, your NK cells. Your monocytes sit right in the middle of your epithelial cell cloud by forward and side scatter, so they're harder to tell um, in these samples, but we have gone back to look for the monocytes and we find a nice monocyte population here as well. If we um, then apply a CD45 by live that gate, you can see that you can pull out a population of live immune cells here, um, which are in our case the population we're most interested in. When we look at um, what those are, we find that they are um, T cells marked by CD3 and B cells by CD19. Uh, there are also HLA-DR positive cells, CD14 positive cells. So if you're really interested in monocytes or other antigen-presenting cells, they are also there. Um, we can find discrete populations of CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells. And then when we go within our CD4 T cell subsets, we find both a conventional CD4 T cell population, which is CD127 uh, high or mid and um, CD25 low, and then a regular, what we think is a regulatory T cell population, which is CD25 high, 127 low, which is this population that's sitting right here. So we're pretty confident that we can identify these populations of interest using this approach. But one of the pieces of feedback we had early on in this project was how do you not how do you know you're not just sort of getting garbage? It's stuff that's blocking off of the vagina and out of the cervix. How do you know that what you're capturing is actually the biology of what's happening in this space? So we wanted to do a small reproducibility study to be able to demonstrate that we could reliably collect immune cell populations. And we had a lot of debate about the best way to do this because we know that most individuals who have cervical vaginas um, have a menstrual cycle. We know hormones might be impacting these populations. So we thought, do we sample at the same time point across multiple cycles? Do we try to pick multiple days that are very proximate to each other within a single cycle? And um, what we ultimately decided to do was enroll five healthy reproductive age individuals. We sampled them on day seven to 11 of the menstrual cycle. <clears throat> and we chose these days because they're happening early in that follicular proliferative phase before you hit the big hormonal peaks associated with ovulation. So we thought there would be the um, less kinetic change in hormone levels across those days. We did sample one individual who was taking continuous birth control who actually had no cycling. So that's one, one of our individuals. We collected paired PBMC, um, and then we asked these individuals to wear the discs for three sequential days. And this was done as a workplace-based study. So people would come in, we'd give them the discs, they'd go about their day, they'd retrieve the disc and hand it back to us for processing in the afternoon. So super easy to do um, from a pragmatic perspective. 
we um, process the cells, as I mentioned to you, and then stain them with a 28 color of spectrometry panel, which was um, uh, shared with us by Martin Philick um, from the Hutch here. And this full spectrometry panel is principally focused on T cells and uh, looking at tissue resident T cells in particular, uh, but it does have other markers to identify other populations of interest. This is the raw data that we retrieved. So we looked at five individuals, we sampled each of them across three days. Um, you can see the composite data here when we're looking at the median cell numbers here or the individual raw data across days. And one point I just want to emphasize is that you don't always collect the same absolute number of cells. And this actually makes a lot of sense when you think about the biology of this space. So there are days where, for example, you might have more cervical vaginal fluid or secretions, days where you might have less. Um, and so the absolute number of cells you collect is not going to be constant across days. We find um, some individuals, for example, where one day we had a particularly low cell collection, but other days where we had very high cell collection. So because of that, we were really interested in understanding um, a lot more about the composition of the populations that were contributing to these, these cells in this space. We did find um, that the highest number of our immune cells were T cells, and this range is very similar to what you would collect from the spider brush, for example. Um, so we think that that's very interesting in terms of our ability to collect an absolute cell number that is close to these more invasive approaches. Um, we also did collect a fair number of B cells, which we haven't done any additional work to phenotype that we're quite interested in. When we look at what it is that we're getting back in terms of T cell phenotyping, um, if we just start by asking what's the distribution of memory populations in this space, we look at CD4s and CD8s here, and we're comparing just PBMCs from the same individual to their cervical vaginal fluid. We're looking at classic markers of main memory groups. So this is CCR7, which is a lymph node homing marker, CD45RA, which is a marker of uh, naive T cells. And what we find is that while in peripheral blood, there's a nice population of naive T cells, both CD4 and CD8, those populations are almost entirely absent from this space. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about aluminal T cell space that constantly encountering antigen. This is also very similar to what we've um, found in breast milk, interestingly. So we're very excited about thinking about shared commonalities across these different mucosal luminal spaces. When we look at how well, um, how reproducible that is within individuals across days, uh, what we find is that the distribution of uh, central memory, which is the population down here that expresses CCR7, effector memory, which is this population here, and then a temra, which is most predominant in our CD8s here. This is the sort of terminally differentiated effector population of CD8s, that it's very consistent across these three days within individuals. So we do find some individuals that, for example, have a very different looking distribution than others, like this participant five, but within themselves across three days, that distribution is quite consistent. We also um, find a good population of tissue resident cells within our CD8 compartment. So these are cells that would be identified as CD69 by CD103 positive. This is the population people um, are very interested in, in terms of having very potent memory population within the tissue. And we can um, definitely collect that population using this approach. It is a, at a lower frequency overall compared to what you would get directly ex vivo from a biopsy, but it's easily identified. When we ask about the phenotype of the cells that we more specifically collect, and the reason we were interested in this is because we wanted to understand how well we could recapitulate what had been published in the, in the literature. So we said, let's look at our CD4 T regs because that's one population people are very interested in in the space in the female genital tract. And what we find is that um, the T regs that we're collecting from this cervical vaginal space, this is just example flow plots here, and then this is our composite data here. They have um, a phenotype that's very consistent with what's been described in this space by particularly colleagues here at the Hutch, like Jenny Lund, Mark Pollock, Florian where they have high expression of these um, suppression markers like IPOS, PD-1, LI3, CTLA-4, and CD3. And then interestingly, they also have high expression of CTR5, which many of you may know as um, a very critical co-receptor of HIV. It also functions as a marker of immune activation. Um, so we're interested to see that then this um, recapitulates what others have published directly from the tissue. 
Similarly, when we look at the CD8 populations that we're finding in this space, it again very much recapitulates what, for example, um, Jenny Lund's group has published thinking about CD8 T cells from the female genital tract, where we find that they have um, both high expression of what we would typically think of as an exhaustion marker, but also are very potent in terms of granzyme feed production, and then also show this activation associated with CCR5. So based off of that data, we were excited that what we were collecting mirrored what others had published specifically from the tissue. But we wanted to understand using all of the data from our high dimensional flow panel, how well people recapitulated themselves when we sampled them across these sequential days. So to ask that question about global population structure, we first conducted a principal component analysis where we're looking at the expression of all of these different markers within our CD3 population. When we include data from both our peripheral blood and our CDF, the first thing we find is that the first principal component is being driven by a sample type. And that makes sense because peripheral blood T cells are very different than cer cervical vaginal T cells. If we um, take out our peripheral blood for these analyses and we look just at the, the memory CD3 T cells coming out of cervical vaginal fluid, we find that people tend to cluster into themselves. So that tells us that when we look at all these high dimensional markers in a composite fashion, we end up with an answer that looks pretty similar across multiple days. And we find the same thing when we look at CD4 populations. So then we wanted to go into this high dimensional data and ask the follow up question, which is well, what's happening at the local population structure level? What's happening in terms of the expression of each of these individual uh, markers in this panel? And in this case, we're using about 20 of those markers. So when we do that with a UMAP approach, and this is a, a way to dimensionally reduce this high dimensional data and apply it into a two dimensional form, you can visualize it. Um, and we did this with the Catalyst R package um, with the help of Mark Carlson, who's a computational biologist we work with a lot. We see the following. So um, first I'm showing you the zoomed out view so that you can see that there's two unique little islands here. This island is particularly interesting, so I've just zoomed in to make it a bit bigger, and I'm just showing you that I um, placed it here. It doesn't actually exist in computational space right here. But what we find is that um, there are two very large clusters of cells that are coming out of cervical vaginal space, and what we've done here is take all the cells from all of our samples from all the people and put it into one space, one computational space. You probably can guess what these two huge clusters are, but these are CD8 T cells right here, and these are CD4 T cells right here. When we do this, we find that there are eight clusters. You can choose how many clusters, but there are eight clusters that explain most of the variance in these cell populations. So of course, the next thing we wanted to ask is what are those eight clusters? How can we actually name those eight clusters? This is Mark, our, bio, our uh, bioinformatics partner, who's been half of the work. And when we do that, um, we can look at the expression of all of our different markers within those eight clusters, and we can start to apply labels to them. So these are labels that I've um, generated to say, I think that's, this is what I think the biologic identity of this cluster is. So for example, um, in these populations here, you can see they have high expression of CD8. They also have high expression of CD103, which is a tissue resident marker. So we um, think that these two populations, for example, are our CD8 tissue resident memory cells, which really only vary by degree of activation. Similarly, this is a CD8 driven population right here that does not display tissue resonant features. So we think this is a typical uh, uh, effector memory population. We can um, similarly apply these labels to our CD4 populations. And in particular, I'll just call out these extremely highly activated CD4 populations that sit at the top of this dendrogram where um, they have a very high expression of all of our activation markers um, and uh, kind of our markers of inflammation. If we then take these populations and we reapply them back to our UMass space, we can start to make some biologic sense out of the patterns that emerge um, from this uh, computational analysis. So for example, when we look at our CD8 T cells here, this dark blue population up here is our typical effector memory population. These salmon colored cells are tissue resident CD8 T cells that are less activated. And then down here in the very south pole of this right lobe of the lung is um, our extremely activated CD8 tissue resident T cells. Similarly, when we move through CD4 space, what we see is um, increasing activation as we move south 
Uh, and then this very south island that's sitting off the coast here is our extraordinarily highly activated CD4 T cell population. So if we then map back to our global analysis and say, well, do people vary in terms of the level of activation that they experience and or the populations that make up their personal cervical vaginal T cell um, uh, population structure? We find that people cluster with themselves like we saw in our uh, PCA analysis, but they do that also when we consider the individual expression of these markers using this catalyst approach. And in particular, I just want to highlight the CCR5 high CD4 T cell populations as a major driving factor that separates people from each other. So the colors um, don't translate, unfortunately, but for example, um, this person who's in pink in our PCA analysis is the yellow person up above, and they have a lot of inflammation. So that's really what we see is that they have a high expression. They have many CD4 T cells and they're highly inflamed. And uh, just to compare it to this person who's in green and violet here, who has very low level of these, CD, these inflamed CD4 T cells. So when we look at what are the loading scores that are making up our principal component one and two, what we find is that PC1 is principally driven by these activation and suppression markers, and PC2 is driven by um, memory markers like CCR7 and CD45RA. If we then say, well, can we look at the composite distribution of our C8, of our um, eight clusters within an individual across their whole luminal T cell population, we end up with a representation that looks like this. Um, the reason that some people have two samples here is if they have less than 100 T cells, we excluded them from the analysis. So that's why some people have two samples here versus three. But what you can see is that people generally look like themselves. So for example, um, I've just aligned them by the degree of CD4 T cell activation or these highly activated CD4 T cells, which are in orange down here. So we think that's really reassuring and is essentially recapitulating what we find in our PCA analysis, which is that people tend to have an overall global population structure that um, is similar across these multiple days. So um, in rapid fire, I hope what you've heard is that this is a very important space in terms of thinking about HIV and SCI acquisition, that sampling is challenging because the current approaches are invasive, which creates a high barrier to participation and limits our ability to do longitudinal sampling, for example, that this menstrual disc approach um, offers a non-invasive alternative to sample in this space, which will hopefully empower a larger and more diverse population of individuals to participate in studies in this space. That we can collect T and B cells, but we also know there are antigen presenting cells there, we know there are NK cells there, if that happens to be your population of interest. We see a lot of neutrophils in our fresh samples, though those don't survive cryopreservation, so you couldn't study neutrophils if you were interested. Uh, you couldn't do cryopreservation if you were interested in neutrophils, but we can see them there. Um, we also have started to look at epithelial cells, thinking that that's an extraordinarily important population of cells at this barrier site. We find that T cell population structure is highly reproducible, but that it seems to vary across individuals. And that's something we're very interested in in terms of thinking about um, microbiome, general inflammation, different um, sexual and health practices. And then we can um, identify populations that closely resemble what others have published from the underlying um, space from surgical biopsies. So one thing that we've been thinking a lot about is uh, potential future uses of this approach. So we've been thinking about it in the context of longitudinal sampling and thinking about variation in the microbiome. We've um, just put in the ground on Tuesday, last Tuesday, thinking about using it as a way to sample the cervical vaginal space in pregnant individuals where we have no alternative. So to start thinking about, can we use it as a way to predict preterm birth? Um, HIV and SCI susceptibility Thinking about it in the context of mucosal vaccine responses. So if you're doing a large HIV vaccine trial and you want to know quickly and easily in a cost-effective manner, are you detecting a response in this space? This is a potential very low barrier approach to do so. And then I'm also thinking about using it as a way to monitor for pathogen clearance and also potentially as a non-invasive way to think about epithelial cell transformation with cervical cancer. So with that, um, I'd just like to thank everyone in my lab and this um, project was led by Quinn um, with computational help from Mark. Thank you. Oh, I can probably acknowledge um, funding for this project, which came from the Institute for Translational Health and um, a lot of seed funding, and then the underlying support of CFAR, which was absolutely practical 
and important for launching my uh, independent research career and was really the first funding source for my first collaboration with uh, Dr. Jackson. So if there's one question, we have time for one question from the audience. If not, I can just quickly interject and ask you, the one woman who had the high level of activated CD4s, did they have you know, any evidence of inflammation or anything like that in their genital tract? I will. Um, so we uh, didn't fully characterize that. We did look at the um, Quinn looked at the smears underneath the microscope, and then that person, we did do some 16S sequencing with Sim, who I think I saw here, and that person um, does have a, what we would call um, a community state type 4 uh, diverse vaginal microbiome, um, but that's an N1, so. Very interesting. Well, thank you so yeah. much, Whitney. Thank you, Jay. Um, My talk is short if anyone has a, another question. Maybe we can circle back and broaden the questions at the end of your talk. Um, so, let me, before I introduce Heather, let me, while everybody's still around, let me put in a plug for um, the January 4th, 4th CIFAR talk. Um, it will be G1 Park, um, who will talk about multi level re re resilience and HIV outcomes among African American Black adults in the southeastern United States, um, and so I, I just want to. And that talk will be presented at the Hans Rosling Center, um, Room One Hundred One, um, from four to five p.m. So I just wanted to put in that plug. Um, so um, the talk we're going to hear next um, is from Heather Jaspin, and um, Heather is a uh, poster child for global health academia um, by achieving the superhuman accomplishment um, of maintaining academic laboratory and clinical activities in both the US and South Africa. Um, she was raised in South Africa and did her undergraduate studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, MD, PhD at Tulane, completed her pediatric residency here at the UW, um, and at which point she was appointed a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town um, in the School of Child and Adolescent Health. She returned to Seattle to complete her Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellowship, joining the faculty at the UW initially in the Department of Pediatrics and subsequently in the Department of Global Health, um, but continued to maintain her laboratory and academic affiliations um, in South Africa. And she can, currently is a professor of pediatrics and global health at the UW with an appointment to the Center for Global Infectious Disease at the Seattle Children's Research Institute. Um, and she's a member of the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town. She runs clinical cohorts in South Africa with laboratories in South Africa um, and Seattle study, studying maternal infant um, immunology and mucosal microbiome microbial immune interactions. Um, and let me pull up your talk here. And she will talk to us on the multifaceted effects of proper IUD, IUD on mucosal environments in African cisgender women. Heather. Thanks so much, Jay. Um, it's really fun to go after Whitney, although she gives such a good talk. Um, it's sort of mixed with mixed feelings. And I'm not going to talk just about proper ID today because I realized I couldn't do a whole hour on, on one topic. So, um, but uh, the reason why I'm telling you about proper ID and contraception today is because it's really important for um, both female human rights, but also for um, the health, not morbidity, and mortality of infants and women um, by preventing unintended pregnancies. But we're very lucky here in that we have a whole slew of choices if you want to go on contraception, but it's um, not all those choices are available all over the world. Um, and the other thing um, that that um, plagues women who are trying to pre prevent unintended pregnancies is that they're at risk for HIV and STIs. Um, 
And unfortunately, there's a lot of there was a lot of observational data suggesting that contraceptives of different sorts are associated with increased risk of HIV and STI acquisition. But just remember that a lot of the studies were flawed in the bias introduced by choice to go on contraception versus not to be on contraception, such as um, condom usage. Um, I stole the slide. I see the top of, of the slide is, is hidden, but I stole the slide from my colleague, that, which beautifully shows how um, what bacterial vaginosis is. Um, and on the left, you see a vagina that is um, considered optimal, dominated by lactobacilli um, species, um, where the pH is low and weak. Um, uh, there's a very strong intact mucosal membrane. And when, when we get ED, these um, lactobacilli are replaced often by a diverse community of facultative anaerobes. The pH is elevated, um, the mucosal barrier is impaired, and um, women experience discharge, poor quality of life, and, and um, potentially increased risk of STIs, HIV, and, and preterm birth. Oops. Oh yeah, and these communities are associated with heightened inflammation in the genital tract, um, mentioned barrier damage, and, and potentially um, an increased uh, recruitment of target cells for HIV, such as Th17 cells and activated C40 cells. Okay, so I think we all here know about ECHO, um, because I think uh, it was run out of uh, Connie's um, unit, uh, where 7,816 to 35 year old women were recruited in 12 sites around South Africa, Kenya, and Swatini. Um, and they were randomized one to one to one to DMPA intramuscularly, levonorgestrel implant, or copper ID. They were followed up for 18 months to assess HIV incidence. And importantly, it was only power to detect a 50% increased risk of, of, of HIV between arms, but that was justified by the fact that if you were to get rid of DMPA as an option for women globally, you would need to have a very good reason. Um, but there was no difference found in um, HIV incidence between the arms. What you can see is that incidence was extremely high, around 4%. And importantly, um, they did not assess other effects or other health outcomes that might be associated with um, contraception in this randomized study. So we took advantage of that, myself and Renee Heffron and my, my colleague in Cape Town, Joanne Parsmore. Renee is now in Alabama, but she was here. Um, by obtaining our own one funding to co-enroll women who were enrolling at three sites in ECHO, um, uh, Vitz in Johannesburg, Emma Mundane in Cape Town, and Kimri in, in Kenya. And um, we co enrolled them into a mucosal sub study and collected a slew of samples. And, and Whitney's already talked about some of those samples side brushes, swabs, soft cups. Um, and um, our R01 funded us to look at pre contraception initiation, one month and six months post contraception initiation. And, and a bunch of, of mucosal markers. So I'll tell you about that first. But importantly, we also had stored specimens from all the women three monthly up to 18 months that we could harness, harness, yeah, harness for future funding. And, and Renee, Joanne, and myself got funding from Gates Foundation. And I'll tell you about those data which aren't published yet. And in that study, we recalled the women two years post echo when we could find them and took another slew of samples and uh, another set of, of data. So I'm first going to show you published, uh, quite a bit of published data um, on the women that we did the pre post contraceptive analysis on initially. Um, and that was about an end of 65 per arm, split between the sides quite almost equally, young women, 24 years of age, um, STI prevalence was around 15%, yeah, chlamydia, um, and about 50% of the women had BB diagnosed by what we call Nugent score, um, which I'll tell you about in a sec. 
or BVS bacterial vaginosis. So this is this is published and I and it's complicated, but I really need to walk you through it. And Brian, the first author of this paper, is sitting here looking just like that photo. Um, but what you can see is each of the columns is a woman. Each of these rows is one of the most um, dominant taxa that we found in the microbiome. Um, here's the site. Here is BV by mutant scoring. Seven to ten is a B, is having bacterial vaginosis, um, and zero to three is no BV, which is shown in pink. I mean, sorry, is shown in blue. BV is shown in pink, and there are a few intermediates shown in purple. And what you can see straight away is that women who have lactobacillus dominated vaginal microbiota, either lactobacillus crispatus here, this very small group, this very large group of lactobacillus in as dominated um, vaginal microbiota women, they have no BV by nutrient scoring, which is a clinical measure, and they have really low intrasample diversity. You can see that the majority of the bugs in there are lactobacilli. So that's what we, we measure with Shannon entropy or Shannon diversity. And you can see that's really low here. But on the other hand, on the right-hand side here in purple are these diverse, what, what would be referred to as CSD4 communities, um, which have no real one single dominant drug in there. There's, there's BVA1, Gardnerella vaginalis, Megasphera, Cynthia crevitella, all previously associated with HIV risk. And these women have really high diversity communities. Um, and just so um, everyone's on the same page, we refer to a lactobacillus dominated, either a lactobacillus crispatus dominated CST community state type as CST1, L inners as CST3, um, and then these diverse ones uh, are various subtypes are CST4. Okay, so what Brian found, um, and it actually was quite surprising because echo results were born, we expected before we got echo results, was that DMPA was gonna do horrible things to the vaginal microbiome. But in fact, what we found was copper IUD use increased vaginal microbial diversity um, over time from enrollment to six months post contraceptive initiation, as well as the clinical measure Nugent score. Um, and DMPA and monogestrol did not do that. Um, in addition, we performed 16 sRNA sequencing to measure bacterial load. And as you can see, copper IUD causes or induces an almost one block fold increase in bacterial load. And whereas DMPA also caused or induced uh, a significant increase in bacterial load, um, this was predominantly due to increased relative abundance or copies of lactobacillus inners. Whereas copper IUD, on the other hand, was a depletion of lactobacillus inners and a enrichment of things of anaerobes such as Smethia, Crotella, um, or Phromonas. Um, this shows you the transitions between CST, community state type across time. In green, as you remember, is the lactobacillus crispatus dominated vaginal microbiomes, L inners in blue and diverse in purple. And whilst you can see that through time, copper IUD users had a shrinkage of lactobacillus dominated community state types and an increase in diverse community state types over time. DMPA almost seemed to increase the relative abundance of uh, CST1, lactobacillus crispatus dominated uh, vaginal microbiota at the expense of CST3 LNS. And we're not really sure if the LNS dominated vaginal microbiome um, is beneficial or not in this setting. LNG uh, implanted absolutely not. So Ramla Tanko in uh, Passmore's lab measured cytokines from the cervical, from the soft cup. Um, and here you can see the fold change in cytokines um, upward between zero and six months of use, or, or, or the decrease if it's downwards, between zero and six months of use. And you can see that almost all the kinds of cytokines we measured were 
significantly increased post copper IUD initiation, whereas DMPA actually seemed to dampen that inflammation. And Brian, in fact, showed that if you took the um, concentrations of cytokines and um, correlated them with the concentrations of bugs that increase in relative abundance or copy number after the initiation of copper IUD, there was quite a strong relationship. Whether what's what's cause and effect, we, we actually probably don't know. Steve Bossinger, one of my colleagues at Emory, and his um, uh, research scientist Prachi Gupta did cervical did transcriptomics of cervical site brushes collected at zero and one month post contraceptive initiation, and straight away you can see that copper IUD is associated with massive initiation is associated with massive changes in gene expression in the cervical in the cervix. Um, and he, what other another thing you can note is you know, much smaller gene expression changes for DMPA and LNG, but that there's very few overlapping genes. And I'm just going to show you, because this is also published, just the copper IUD data. Um, and here this shows you the, um, on the left, gene set enrichment analysis of gene sets um, that we picked to uh, look at that are were significantly up or down regulated um, between zero and one month uh, of copper IUD use. And you can see straight away that there are pathways associated with um, T inflammation, uh, T cell activation, um, IL, you know, inflammatory cytokines, TNF alpha, and also um, stress. And then another gene set that we looked at was the telethiamine. Um, reactome, and I, mean, I suppose that's not really surprising because copper is a metal that we saw a huge um, upregulation of genes uh, responding to metallophionics uh, of genes, yeah. um, and ISGs, of course, interferon-stimulated genes. So what we thought um, was, is it copper that's doing this, or is it this maybe via the microbiome, or, or what and the only way we thought to test this was to take um, endothelial cervical endothelial endothelial epithelial cells in vitro and add copper. And here you see serial dilutions of copper, uh, heat kill E. coli as a positive control, and media alone as a negative control. And as um, we diluted the copper, there was a non-significant decrease in IL-6, but even almost an increase in IL-1 beta. So there was not it doesn't, did not seem like the cells were responding to copper in the right way, and they weren't having more activation. But what we did definitely saw was a dose response in vascular endothelial growth factor, which makes sense because copper IUD induces a lot of bleeding in women who use it. Um, so possibly um, in vivo, it's either the microbiome that causes all of those gene expression changes and inflammation, or we could have been sampling. We could have, uh, in vitro experiment, didn't have immune cells in it, only had epithelial cells, but maybe there's other cells that are um, expressing all those genes. Then Ruby Bungeon in Joanne Passmore's lab, she, she, she was amazing. She took fresh side brushes. So Whitney talks about cryopreserving uh, no, she took these cells fresh every day when they got back from the clinic, stained them, acquired them every day from all these women at baseline and one month post contraceptive initiation. And to our surprise, copper IUD did not really make a significant difference in um, the frequency of activated T cells, nor the frequency of TH17 like cells in the cervix. Instead, DMPA seem to induce uh, an increase in frequency of both these types of cells, activated T cells and TH17 cells. When you look at the phenotype of the TH17 like cells, um, pre on the top and post contraceptive initiation, you can see that um, whilst copper IUD and immunogestrol um, do not significantly change the phenotype of TH17 cells, DMPA um, caused or, or is associated with a significant increase in the, the, the activated TH17 cells in the cervix. 
So TH17 cells, in addition to being HIV target cells, are also really important for mucosal integrity and for candidal, um, anti-candidal immunity. So we looked into um, these, both of these as a possible etiology for um, this increase in TH17 cells. And here you can see this is done at an emergence lab. Um, only the women who were uh, using DMPA, um, you can see the women who had an increase in TH17 cells between baseline and, and one month post contraceptive initiation in red. And those were the decrease in blue. Um, and then you can see um, the log fold change of gene expression in the, the heat map. And you can see there's definitely a bunch of genes that are upregulated in women who have increased TH17 cells with DMPA. And those genes were in um, pathways such as anti protease activity, cell adherence, um, microtubule cell matrix adhesion, and all things that are important for mucosal um, integrity. We did also look at the relationship between a TH17 cell frequency and candidate detection. This is work done by um, Mel Gasper in the lab, who's also here, uh, nodding at me somewhere there, yeah, waving. Um, and she found absolutely no um, correlation between candidate PCR positivity and the frequency of CD4 T cells that are activated or TH17 like cells. Although this is in contrast to what we found in an adolescent cohort in South Africa, um, which was done by Anna Happel, um, which actually found that there was a decreased frequency of TH17 cells and activated CD4 T cells when she could detect Canada present. Um, Mel also looked to see if contraceptive arm made any difference in whether or not she could detect Canada by PCR. And although you may see a little bit of an increase in Canada positivity in the copper and the Indian PA arms, this is not significant. Um, but she did find, like others, that there is a strong correlation with um, between having Canada hyphen present on your weight mount and Shannon, the, the, the vaginal microbiome, bacterial microbiome. Um, with there being, uh, when, the, when yeast was present or visible, a much lower diversity um, community uh, that clustered distinctly from those without yeast visible. And funny enough, this was not um, detectable if you used PCR, only if you looked at the height. So if Canada was present by PCR, we didn't find this association, but when, when Canada was visible on the high beam, we did. And what we think this is due and we're hoping to test um, in the future um, is this, this paper from the Rubik lab um, where they found that uh, cyanidase can inhibit hyphen formation from Canada and bacterial associated, the bacterial vaginosis bacteria often make cyanidase. So we're hoping um, to have a mechanism there, explore that mechanism. Okay, so we began to think, and all this is unpublished and very, very preliminary, what could be the mechanism through which copper IED changes the vaginal microbiome? It could kill lactobacilli preferentially, either by, for example, intracellular accumulation of cations, certain bacteria are more susceptible to that versus other, uh, or induction of proviruses and lice bacteria. Um, it could be that the copper IUD induced bleeding could either preferentially kill lactobacilli or allow growth of the associated organism, or it could just be the physical foreign body itself, which we can't really test unless we do that, maybe, in, which we wanted to, an RCT, a randomized trial between even a just drug and treat our system and a copper ID. Well, Brian already showed that um, when he put in decreasing con concentrations of copper, that lactobacillus growth was inhibited in a dose-dependent way, but not group B strip or E. coli, other vaginal pathobionts. Although we're hoping to do the same experiment with, with anaerobes. And then uh, Sarah Lee, who I think maybe here as well in the lab in undergrad, uh, supervised by Mel, did this checkerboard experiment where they, they put in decreasing concentrations of copper and decreasing co concentrations of hemin, which is what we think is the best way to emulate 
iron that might be present in a dental tract. You're not going to have free cations flying around without bacteria taking them up or being bound to hemoglobin. And what you can see in, in purple is really no growth where there's higher concentrations of copper and slightly better growth as the concentrations go lower. But that, that hemin, except for this very, very high concentration, really doesn't have a dose response in growth. And this is the area under the curve of these growth curves. You can see no growth here in purple, medium growth here in blue, and in the pink, some really good normal growth curves. So we think that copper is probably doing um, killing lactobacillus, but, we, but again, we want to confirm this with other anaerobes, et cetera. Okay, I said something about that prophage, and this is data from Anna Happel in the South African lab, where she looked at the metagenomes of bacteria from a whole bunch of South African adolescents, not the age of cohort. Um, and you can straight away see that L. crispatus is jam-packed with provirus-like elements. Whereas other lactobacilli and media associated bugs have very few. Um, so we thought, could, could we induce um, these prophage and kill lactobacilli? And um, we're still trying to work out how to do that with copper, but here you can see a beautiful phage that was found in the supernatant when we added mitomycin. So here's Elchris, uh, uh, an isolate from a South African woman. Uh, sorry, this is no, no Elchris. This is Elchris growing happily by itself. And here is Elchris with mitomycin, and that's what we found in the super A whole bunch of these. I just showed you the previous one. Um, okay, I'm going to switch gears to the Gates funded part of the study. And what they're very interested in is HPV. Um, because it's the most prevalent STI globally, it causes cervical cancer. And they also were very interested in whether there was a relationship between the medical microbiome and HP. Um, so they funded us to look at all the rest of the time points and, as they said, to bring the women back two years post-echo post completion. And remember now, the women were, did not have to be on their randomized contraceptive anymore, so they could choose at this point. Um, and we, when we brought them back, we took more demographics, we did a pap smear, and as I mentioned, we did um, bacterial um, 16 ACE PCR at all time points, and we did HPV gene timing using the joint thermal chip kit. So this is a slightly larger cohort um, than we were funded for, to do with the R01, but very similar to the, the smaller analysis that we did earlier. Um, I'm just going to skip over that. Oops. Um, and what we see is when we look longitudinally all the way through 60 months at the vaginal microbiome, and this was analysis done by Sim Dudley, um, you can see that through time, the vaginal mi microbial diversity continues to increase post six months, which is what we published. Um, and this is only showing the women who were still on, on copper IND at the two months post echo. Oops. Um, here is um, DMPA again, absolutely no effect um, longitudinally, pretty inert on the vaginal microbiota. But what's really surprising to us was when we really thought that even a gestural did nothing the immunogestral um, implant did nothing to the vaginal microbiota because we looked through month six. When you start looking out at month 12 and even five years after a randomization in the women who are still using an implant, the vaginal microbiota diversity continues to rise. Such that, whereas at six months, we only saw a difference between um, copper IUD and DMPA, or, or levonorgestrel. Now, levonorgestrel implants and copper ID both had significantly higher vaginal microbial diversity than DMPA. So a little bit complicated, but bear with me. Here you can see um, that the PPA of the communities in each woman um, with the CST1 vaginal microbiota clustering here down the bottom in green. Um, the LN is predominant microbiota over here in the top right, and these diverse microbiomes here in the top left. At enrollment, you can see these are colored by randomization arms. You can see there's a 
very equal distribution in the PCOA space, but by six months, you can see that the copper ID users start to accumulate in that left diverse CST corner. But by 12 months, levonorgestrel is competing for that space. So both LNG and high copper ID induced a shift towards more diverse communities by 12 months. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about HPV real quick. Um, and as I said, we tested each woman that we had longitudinal samples from uh, through time. But this is the baseline HPV prevalence, showing any HPV in this bar, any high risk HPV, so that's an HPV that uh, is known to cause cancer. Uh, the HPVs that are in the non availant HPV vaccine, in the quadrivalent, which is now available in Kenya, was not available to these women, and the bivalent, which was is available in South Africa, but not available to these women. And, and the prevalence of all the high-risk HPVs, all the highest, the most common HPVs. And straight away, you can see that type 35 and type 56, which are not in any vaccine, were present in 8% of the women. You can straight away see that, um, well, 16, 18, 35, and 45 are quite prevalent, and they're responsible for the majority of cancers worldwide. And that we're really, with the even with the non-avalent, really missing a lot of high-risk HPVs in African women. Um, Anna looked at the incidence of HPV according to arms, longitudinally, obviously. Um, and you can see that copper ID users had a higher incidence of any HPV and maybe in high risk or low risk HPV, such that in a Cox performance hazards ratio analysis, using DMPA as the reference, um, copper ID users had a 2.3 hazards uh, ratio of HPV incidence. And if you use even a gestural implant as the reference, 2.2. So you're straight away, you're thinking, is the reason why HPV is incidence is higher in the copper IUD arm because it causes an alteration of the vaginal microbiome? Are these two things related? So what we tried to do, what Sim tried to do to answer this was to take the women who were HPV negative at baseline and who had an incident HPV infection, um, to take the visit, the microbiome at the visit before and match that with a person who remained HPV negative throughout the study at a matched visit, compared their microbiome. And you can see that um, at least Shannon, the Shannon diversity between at the pre-incident visits in cases was the same as controls, and so was the community composition. However, there were some taxa that were enriched in, 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 in the pre-incident um, time point, vaginal microbiome, in cases versus controls, and we're looking forward to testing them for causation. We also looked at clearance, and as expected in this young uh, group of women, there was really quite a lot of clearance of, of HPVs, and this is shown by type for the most common types, and then high risk HPVs in the second from bottom row here. Uh, if you cleared any high risk HPV, there were a lot of co infections or all your, your HPV, your high-risk HPVs. So a lot of clearance, it was really difficult. Oh, yeah, but the lowest clearance rates were for those very um, high-risk HPVs, 35, 16, and 45. Um, we did a comparison across arm, but in a type-specific manner, and it was sort of all over the place. Like for HPV 16, copper ID and DMPA users were more likely to clear them implant users, HPV-18, copper ID users, also more likely to care. Um, but then finally, um, we did uh, pap smears I mentioned, um, and they were only uh, 15, we, we had 155 women who had, who had pap smears and 15 of them had abnormal pap smears. And what you can see is that some women who were HPV positive at every time point we tested, shown in the orange. Um, white is that we didn't have a sample at that point. They, were, they still had normal pap smears, so that's across five years. And some women who never tested positive for an HPV still had an abnormal pap smear. 
So we possibly need, we are possibly missing some of the high risk HPVs um, with the testing that we're using. So in summary, um, I think we figured out that copper IUD induces persistent changes in the vaginal microbiome up to five years. That the implant, the immunological implant, might also cha change some things in the vaginal microbiota after long term use. Um, unfortunately, high risk HPV genotypes are common in Eastern Southern Africa, and it looks like we need an African specific HPV vaccine um, to reduce the risk of cervical cancer, if only everyone were to be able to, to get vaccinated. Um, that HPV incidence is higher in women assigned to copper ID compared to DMPA and nemogestral implant, but it does not seem to be related to copper IUD induced effects on. The global microbiome, maybe some taxon specific um, variation. Um, and since copper IUD is the only non hormonal reversible contraceptive available or long term contraceptive available for women in lots of parts of the world, I think we really need to um, do more work in this area. So that I'd like to thank uh, all the people in Seattle Lab that whose work I showed today in Cape Town, and my collaborators Joanne 